Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Emma, the Volunteer Coordinator at Endometriosis UK. I'm only on audio tonight to avoid any technical difficulties, but you'll be able to see Liza and her screen. Um, and tonight we'll be joined by Dr. Liza Ball, Consultant Gynecologist at Bart's NHS Trust. Liza will be sharing the standard of support hospitals provide leading up to surgery, on the day and for aftercare. She'll also share with you what you can do to prepare for each stage. Liza has an interest in endometriosis, pelvic pain and fibroids. After specialising in training in the UK, she's trained in the USA in advanced laparoscopy. A massive thank you to Liza for joining us. After this webinar, all guests will receive an optional feedback survey from us by email. This will give you a chance to share your thoughts, give any suggestions for improvement and suggest any webinar topics. The webinar will also be available on the website very soon. There will be a Q&A at the end of this talk. If you've already sent in your questions by email, we have them. But for those still wanting to submit a question, please use the Q&A function. I will now pass over to Liza. Thank you very much. It gives me great pleasure to be here tonight with you. Um, I've put together a few slides and I'm going to share the screen now. So this is the topic I would like to cover, laparoscopic surgery before, during and after. And I'm going to touch on how practice has varied due to the pandemic. And I would like to acknowledge my registrar, Ellie, who might be in the audience, who has helped producing a, a few uh, of the slides. Okay, so. Um, the uh, institutions I have mentioned here, the BSGE is the British uh, Society of Gyne Endoscopy. It's our professional um, body. And also this is the institution that acknowledges uh, what center gets the accreditation for endometriosis center. QMULN City University are the two universities that I work for and Bart's Health and Princess Grace Hospital are the two hospitals where I work. I don't have any conflicts of interest, which means I am not paid by um, uh, any reps or uh, industry. So what is happening in the NHS? Um, I, I presume many of you in the audience might have been uh, at home during the pandemic uh, in a lot of pain with uh, symptoms of endometriosis, waiting for care. Uh, and it, it fills me with great sadness that uh, in the NHS, we were not able to provide the usual care for chronic conditions such as endometriosis. It hasn't been a, an easy time for us. Um, we had three of our junior doctors on ITU with COVID. I had COVID myself twice. Uh, one of our midwives died of COVID. So it affected us in the front line. However, things look a bit better now. Um, with the, we're moving into phase that I would like to call uh, post-pandemic recovery. Um, but we have to acknowledge that uh, a, a lot of surgery was cancelled and very few cases could go ahead. In my own hospital, we were able to operate a little bit in the summer, uh, but for most of the year, we were only uh, open to absolute emergency surgeries, life and death situations where there was internal bleeding from ectopic pregnancy uh, and similar. Even a lot of the uh, cancer surgery was canceled. Um, what was happening in the summer and is happening a little bit now is that uh, some of the surgeries get outsourced to the private sector. Reason being, we would like to operate on uh, people with, for instance, endometriosis who have planned surgery in COVID clean spaces. And we wouldn't like people who come in for day surgery to get mixed up with uh, people who have COVID. Uh, the other big issue, apart from a lot of us doctors being, being sick and off with COVID, was that the anaesthetists um, had to go to ITU and, and some of us um, 
non-anesthetic doctors also had to go to ITU and look after the sick COVID patients there. So what we're doing currently, um, I've, I've taken a screenshot and I've been very careful not to show any patient details on that screenshot. This is, uh, these are our waiting lists. These are, in, in my case, it's um, mainly uh, women who are waiting for their surgery for endometriosis. And we've been asked to do vetting, which means um, prioritizing. So whilst uh, we're now having the odd list uh, restarting, uh, we've been asked to um, find out who the most urgent um, patients are who need to get done first. Um, the, the next point I have called staying in touch because we have been uh, very busy during the COVID year. It hasn't been so easy to um, stay in touch. A lot of the uh, appointments have moved to phone appointments, but many trusts have um, written letters to patients on the um, on the waiting list and I have helped drafting such a letter uh, basically to convey our um, our compassion and and show that whoever is waiting on the waiting list is is not forgotten um, now I'm moving away from the pandemic and I would like to talk about the normal timeline for surgery. So I've, I've depicted this in the blocks and the first block um, involves the step where this decision is made to actually do surgery. And that could be uh, before or after trying some non-surgical treatment such as um, hormone treatment, uh, physio, lifestyle changes. And uh, that could be um, done. And if it's so successful, then decision is to not do surgery or a decision is to do surgery. And in the meantime, whilst waiting for surgery, some non-surgical treatments uh, could be started. And then um, I have also mentioned a pre-operative workup. And this has nothing to do with getting worked up about the surgery. It means doing some imaging and some tests so that the surgical team uh, have a bit better understanding what they might encounter on the day of surgery. The next step, the second block, takes us to a pre-admission appointment which is usually run by a nurse and it involves um, drawing blood, uh, taking blood pressure, doing a risk assessment for um, general anesthesia and then taking some swabs and in, in the COVID time, giving instruction on isolation. Then we're moving to the third block and that involves the day of surgery and for endometriosis, it is, um, nowadays most commonly a keyhole surgery and then we either are facing um, day surgery where um, uh, you can go home uh, in the evening or a, a one night stay uh, and then there's a, a ward round after the surgery um, and a letter is given with details about the operation. And the final step involves the whole area of follow up, and that could be the follow up with the GP or the GP nurse after a few weeks or um, after a shorter time if um, sutures need to be removed. Uh, and then we have uh, in some trusts and in some cases uh, after a few months a follow up in the gynae clinic to review the success of the surgery and to find out if any other treatment is necessary in addition to surgery. So I'm going back to the first block, decision for surgery. Uh, I believe that the decision for surgery should be coming out of a patient-focused discussion. Uh, in the old days, we had a situation where a doctor turned around and decided what was best 
the um, NHS philosophy is moving away from this um, paternalistic approach and we uh, want to uh, tailor the, the right treatment uh, for you as the patient. Uh, I am a strong believer that um, a, a patient should be told how likely surgery is going to help. Um, I, I know from feedback from patients that this discussion is not always happening. I feel it is very, very important. Uh, I've been trying to work out a, um, a tool, a statistical tool uh, in order to help um, predicting how likely surgery is um, uh, to give pain relief based on things uh, like age and severity of symptoms. And that is work in progress. Uh, I feel um, during that discussion, alternatives should be mentioned, risks of surgery should be mentioned, and then additional procedures, um, which includes po the possibility of doing a hysteroscopy or fitting a Mirena coil. And then we have the preoperative workup, which I'm going to cover. In that little hand sketch, I have um, depicted a, a uterus, can you see my arrow? Um, well, I, I'm, I'm just showing the inside of the uterus with the lining of the uterus. And in adenomyosis, some of the cells that are supposed to line the uterus have actually migrated into the wall of the uterus. And every month they're making a microscopic period and causing a bruise. And if the Mirena works, and it works well for, for many women, the um, healing hormones from the Mirena actually thin out the lining of the womb, but they also suppress the adenomyosis cells. So that, that monthly bruising um, is, uh, is improving. The preoperative workup. Um, uh, this is um, a series of investigations, which you might or might not get. Um, that can help predict what is found during surgery. So how severe the endometriosis is or how likely the endometriosis is and um, what to expect is a pelvic examination. Uh, and with endometriosis, sometimes the, uh, the uterus is tilted backwards. Uh, the word there is retroverted and it is not very mobile because of some scarring. Uh, and that would already be a good pointer towards the uh, possibility of endometriosis. Uh, an ultrasound scan uh, can be useful in detecting ovarian cysts uh, and some uh, people with special training can also find endometriosis implants. But if the ultrasound doesn't show anything, uh, it doesn't completely rule out uh, endometriosis. That's an important thing to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, now, if someone has uh, likely very advanced endometriosis, for instance, the uh, examination is very uncomfortable and the uterus is tilted backwards and doesn't want to move, um, uh, and especially if there are also bowel symptoms, so pain with bowel movements, for instance, uh, as a surgeon, I would like to know whether the bowel is affected because under those circumstances, the, the surgery um, might have to be done together with a bowel surgeon. So if the MRI indicates that there's endometriosis affecting the bowel or perhaps affecting the bladder, then a, even a, a specialized endometriosis um, surgeon can't do it all by themselves. They, they need the multidisciplinary team. And that is what MDT stands for. Uh, so after the, an MRI scan in suspected severe endometriosis, there might be an MDT meeting happening where the um, specialists get together, have a look at the image uh, and then um, talk about the surgical planning, what options are available. Uh, and then the patient uh, is supposed to be phoned back and kept in the loop or brought back to clinic. So that the, the operative plan can be confirmed. 
Uh, and now we're moving to the third block, which is the pre-admission clinic. Um, and in the times of COVID, if your surgery is happening in a private hospital, and this is commonly the case, that the private hospitals are helping the NHS hospitals because the NHS hospitals are still overrun with COVID patients. Um, so there are different models. One model is your uh, if you have been referred to an NHS unit and you've already seen a, a team there, you might actually stay with that team and that team travels to the private unit and um, performs surgery there. Uh, and sometimes in, in more uh, in less uh, specialized uh, situations where the endometriosis is perhaps less advanced. Um, it is also possible that the surgery is undertaken by a different team who works in the private hospital. Um, so that, that is just about the location and how private hospitals are helping the NHS at the moment. Um, in the pre-admission clinic, uh, it is very important that some of the blood tests are done in the hospital where you have the surgery. So it might be worthwhile uh, double checking on your documentation to make sure if you're in the NHS unit or in the private unit. Some of the pre-admission clinic might be done over the phone because as a rule of thumb, uh, the NHS would like to reduce footfall to any hospital because even uh, traveling um, during the um, pandemic um, is, is a risk and whatever can be done over the phone uh, will be considered to be done over the phone. A pre-admission clinic is a little MOT, like an MOT for your car, a safety check. Are we safe to go ahead with surgery or are there some health risks from coexisting um, conditions like high blood pressure, for instance, or diabetes. And sometimes these things haven't been detected yet. Um, so that is important to do a safety check so that on the day of surgery, it can be done as safe as possible. The blood tests are looking towards checking for anemia which means a, a lack of red blood cells, and that can happen from heavy periods, for instance. We also uh, are bound by the hospital rules to check the blood group. In the rare case that there is heavy, unexpected bleeding during the operation, and then we would like to be in a position to give a blood donation. Um, then we ask for swabs and the MRSA is called a hospital bug, which is a bit of a misnomer. It should be more thought of as a bug that is very resistant to the normal antibiotics. If you talk about hospital bug, you think it only lives in the hospital, but the problem is the hospital bug is actually brought into the hospital, for instance, by people who don't know they have it and they bring it into the day surgery unit. So that is why the swabs for that bug uh, need to happen in the pre-admission clinic and then swabs for COVID. Uh, and then uh, because of the pandemic, uh, instructions will be given about how long to self-isolate prior to surgery. When I talked about giving a prognosis, I um, charted the um, period pain, painful sex and quality of life before and after surgery of my so stage four uh, endometriosis patients. So that with this kind of knowledge, I can then help give people a, a likelihood of how likely they are to respond. So people with very severe endometriosis have high levels of period pain, which is the, the left side of the graph here. The people start off at period pain 10 out of 10, 9 out of 10, or you know, down to uh, 6 out of 10. And then after six months, which is this line here, we see that uh, apart from one, one patient, all patients have a lesser score of period pain and that continues at the one year and two year mark. Uh, quality of life has the trend to go up and painful sex also responds to endometriosis surgery. So 
if we look at the quality of life, having a low score of quality of life, 42 out of 100, that was the average of uh, my patients before surgery. And then after six months, it was uh, 67 and 12 months, 64. And after 24 months, 71 out of 100. So the quality of life got increasingly better after surgery. So surgery uh, has, a, has a role in making painful sex, period pain, quality of life better. Uh, and, and this is for women who have very severe endometriosis involving the bowels. And this is an unselected uh, group of patients so that they are just, they came in the order. Um, so when we think about what else has to happen before surgery, uh, we are talking about counseling, which is the information giving from the doctor and consent, which is what the patient does um, when they sign this yellow form, is basically a patient giving the permission to the doctor to carry out the surgery that will be um, listed here. Uh, also what surgeries uh, they don't want. Um, then on this form, we need to mention that the doctor needs to mention the main risks, which I've put in this little box which is bleeding from uh, inadvertently traumatizing a large blood vessel with the um, uh, laparoscopic instruments, introducing infection to the body or traumatizing the womb or the neighbors of the womb, including bowel, bladder and ureter. And there's a picture that shows all these organs later on in the talk. Now, what else happens before surgery? This is a completely new concept called prehabilitation. You might all be familiar with the concept of rehabilitation, which you might uh, have to do after a stroke. It is the sort of getting better after something happened. Prehabilitation is getting better before something happens. So it's a, it's a new concept and it involves something you can do for yourself. The idea is to optimize um, your health before surgery so that you bounce back from surgery better. Uh, I often see when people are really run down and in a lot of pain, it takes longer to recover from that low baseline of health. But if... Um, if one can manage to get onto a higher level of, uh, of health, then recovery is better. Uh, also, um, it's important to stay healthy in order to, in the unlikely case that you catch COVID, that you also bounce back better from COVID. And the areas that are part of that prehabilitation uh, to work on is stress management, increasing fitness, um, smoking cessation, losing some weight, uh, normalizing the blood pressure and correcting anemia by taking iron supplements. When I was looking for uh, a nice patient information website, I found that St. George's Hospital in London has uh, publicized that and I've put in the link for you. It's a very nice uh, website. So now we're moving closer to surgery. What to do on the day before surgery? Uh, I've done a little bit of research to find how you can get yourself into a good mindset. And um, music plays a big role in that. So I uh, pulled together evidence from all over the world of so 6,000 patients. And uh, I've just wrote that up as a paper. From other people's research, it showed that when you listen to music before, during and after surgery, but especially before, um, the pain score after surgery, when, when you wake up from surgery is two centimeters lower on a 10 centimeter scale than if you hadn't listened to surgery. Um, also anxiety levels are uh, lower and the all over experience is seen as more positive when you listen to music. So you can put together a phone playlist and <coughs> uh, 
the idea is to put music that works for you. Soothing music was the music that I, I reviewed in the paper. Um, relax and unwind. Uh, if, if yoga works for you, do some yoga. Uh, there might be the instruction to take some laxatives or bowel prep. And I think it's a really good idea not to go to work the day before surgery, but dedicate that to getting yourself, uh, you know, into the right mindset and, and do the bowel prep because in response to the medication, it can feel like a travel diarrhea and you don't want to work even from home uh, if you have to run to the toilet. Um, I think it's a really good idea to clean the belly button because the belly button is used to, um, as part of the operation is oftentimes uh, a cut is made at the base of the belly button and the, um, uh, a, a plastic tube is introduced and through that tube uh, we introduce a telescope. So belly button is a difficult area of the body to clean because it's so deep and has so many wrinkles, uh, but with an earbud it can be overcome and that reduces the risk of infection. Generally, we, we say not to shave the day before unless there were special instructions. I think it's a good idea to take out the little leaflet um, that gives the instructions when to be where, especially now there might be um, different hospitals from the ones that you, you visited previously. Uh, it could be a private hospital and, and then it might be good to check on Google Maps how to get there. And the time given is really important because the whole day runs um, on the presumption that people turn up on time. Uh, so the last sentence is really to, um, what, what, what I wanted to say is um, transport and collection arrangements because during COVID, uh, oftentimes, uh, depending on the, the hospital, the family can't come in with you. Um, so it's important to leave the contact number with the nurses uh, or um, get your relatives to ring in uh, for the pickup arrangements. The day of surgery. So on the day of surgery, you will meet uh, several groups of people. The first one who usually uh, who welcome you is the nursing team who will check blood pressure and temperature and go through the pre-admission chart and uh, do a, a formal procedure called admitting you to the hospital. So they also make sure that you're registered on the system so that everything that is logged on the system actually finds a place. Uh, the next group is usually the anesthetic team. And these are doctors specialized in um, giving the general anesthesia during the procedure. Uh, but they also really need to know whether you suffer from chronic pain um, prior to the surgery and whether you take regular morphine related or opioids, um, or opioid medication, because that will affect the type of anesthesia and pain relief they can offer. So it's well worth being honest with the anesthetic team so they can tailor the general anesthetic and the pain relief afterwards uh, to your needs. Also with if during previous surgery, there was problems passing urine afterwards or vomiting. These are the people who can help learn from past experience and make it better, the better experience this time. And finally, the surgical team will be there. And in many cases, you will see um, familiar faces from people who you have uh, been in contact before. Uh, sometimes you see completely uh, new faces uh, and, and that is a good opportunity to just go over um, the surgical plan, for instance, um, you know, what will be removed, what you don't want to have removed, whether a Mirena system is acceptable or not. And then this yellow form that I showed a few slides higher up that, that gets countersigned 
and then the teams get ready for you in the operating theater and you listen to your playlist but no food um, otherwise the general anesthesia would become more dangerous in some trusts uh, you can have sips of water and then the general anesthetic is uh, either given in a, a little room that is in front of the operating room or in the operating room itself. And if you've mentioned it to the anesthetic team before, that's also the time when you can still listen to music, perhaps just put one earphone in so that if the anesthetic team wants to tell you something, you can still hear what they're saying. Um, and then it's really time to mentally hand over uh, to the anesthetic and the surgical team and uh, let the teams take care of you. <coughs> and the general anesthesia will then be given, the operation will be done. And the next thing that you will notice with the surgery is when you wake up. Uh, and this is usually in a recovery room, but it could also be on the ward. And then um, there's a ward round where the surgical team come round and give feedback. But that ward round is, uh, is a bit of an interesting one. Through from the effects of the general anesthesia, uh, it can affect the memory. And I've had really long conversations with patients and they asked me really smart questions and then forgot all about the post-operative ward round and denied that I ever came to talk to them, despite, uh, you know, we had a conversation. Uh, so that is why I think it's really important to give some written information and to make follow-up arrangements and also SOS contacts with, uh, with the nurse if questions should arise. Um, now we're moving to post-operative recovery. Uh, and the motto here is take it easy, listen to your body, because this is not the time to push yourself, it is a time to heal and bounce back from surgery. I often get asked, when can I start doing this activity, when can I start doing that activity? So I looked into the data and the average time for get, uh, going back to sort of looking after the house, six days, shopping, 12 days, biking, office work, 12 days, and light exercise, 16 days. Uh, and the questions I often get asked about uh, having sex, and there I would say, wait for the next period, because there is a, a, a barrier that the body forms in the neck of the womb um, that, uh, that helps with uh, infection prevention. So I would probably wait until that time or whenever the body feels ready after that time. Because it's not only the body that needs to recover from surgery, there's also emotional health. I um, often get feedback from people that they feel well, go back to work really quite early and then feel very vulnerable to you know, conflict or uh, difficult situations. So emotional resilience is weaker after surgery. And that's why it's a good idea to make sure that you get better before you go back to work. Uh, in the post-operative time, sometimes sutures need to be removed. I personally use a medical grade super glue that just flakes off. Uh, sutures are often removed up to a week and that can be done in the GP practice and with a clinical specialist nurse and the GP might be your first port of call for minor complaints. And if there is a, a bigger problem, it might be a good idea to go to A&E. So post-operative information and follow-up. You see a, a doctor on the phone, and this is what we now often do in order to decrease footfall during the pandemic. We moved a lot of the appointments to phone appointments, but this is not a default. We still have the option for face-to-face -face appointments, but a phone appointment might be done at your follow-up to check in with you, see if you've recovered from surgery and how the surgery, what the surgery has done for you. Um, as I highlighted before, written information is really important. So. Uh, Usually um, one copy of the letter goes to the GP and another copy for you saying what procedure was done, 
briefly what was found and a treatment suggestion. Uh, the matron on the uh, post-operative ward can usually sign a sick note for the hospital stay and uh, for longer sign-offs um, the GP might have to be uh, contacted. Uh, as I said, a GP, GP nurse would deal with stitches and minor infections of the uh, stitch sites. Um, and then in, in my own practice, I do a um, review after six months to get a helicopter view of how the surgery has affected um, the general well-being. Now, a question that often gets asked is, how can it be that there's ongoing pain after the endometriosis was removed? And I put this slide together in response to the question uh, because we could be dealing with an incomplete removal. Sometimes um, with endometriosis, there are cysts, but there's also a plaque of adhesions uh, near the neck of the womb. And if the cysts get removed, but the plaque um, gets left behind, there can be residual pain from that. Endometriosis can come back. There is a sort of a genetic tendency if someone is more open to endometriosis from a genetic point of view, recurrence is possible regardless. Um, there seems to be a, a role for taking contraceptive hormones to uh, reduce the recurrence, but it's not a 100% guarantee. Um, Ongoing pain after surgery could be from pain memory, which is a condition where the body grows extra pain nerves and reinforces the chronic pain that was there from the endometriosis. And that signaling continues until even when the endometriosis is removed. Uh, pain memory is something that needs to be, uh, uh, that can be addressed, but that needs to be addressed in a, a specialist setting together with the GP. Um, pain could be arising from the bowel or the bladder. There's a condition called bladder pain syndrome, and there's a condition called irritable bowel syndrome, and they are known to coexist with endometriosis. Uh, so there they might be the need to look into diet or specific treatment for these two conditions. And finally, there might be this condition called adenomyosis. And if you remember this slide where I showed the Mirena coil, where these little cells from the lining of the womb had, had gone into the wall of the womb, this is adenomyosis, this, this bruising of the uterus. Um, and if uh, adenomyosis is there um, and the, the womb remains and the endometriosis is removed, the womb remains and adenomyosis remains, then um, the um, contraceptive hormones like the combined pill or a high dose progesterone, for instance, uh, the pill injection could be used. Um, it could be even uh, involving giving something like Zolodex, although that is a pretty strong medication for adenomyosis. Simple pain relief, uh, Mirena works. And then we have the TENS unit, which is a transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation that can also work for people with adenomyosis. Not everything works for everyone. So it might be a business of trying one or two things before you find the right treatment. Um, so the, the just reinforcing the Mirena system, it, it has a local action and I always um, liken it to nail varnish. You put it in one place and not a lot gets absorbed into the whole system. So the, the dose of hormones is much, much lower than with the contraceptive tablets. Uh, which means like whole body side effects, like effect on mental health or uh, headaches is actually much less frequent than with the, with the pill hormones. Um, what it does, it suppresses periods and suppresses migrated cells. It's licensed for five years for contraceptive purposes, but 
they cause it adenomyosis. You really rely on the hormone, the little coat of hormones that I depicted here. Um, it might be that even after four years, the adenomyosis discomfort comes back and the Mirena has to be changed after four years rather than five years. And initially, um, people to, uh, complain of spotting, which is the body's getting used to the Mirena, the Mirena's getting used to the body. And usually after six periods, the spotting gets much better. Not everyone gets spotting. Some people just um, uh, have no, no spotting whatsoever. I often get asked about the role of a hysterectomy in severe endometriosis. And I, um, I just did that little hand sketch to, to just talk about this uh, in a bit more detail. So what we have here, these, these yellow lines are the ureters. Uh, they drain the urine from the kidneys into the bladder. Uh, and these are structures that very occasionally, that black stuff that I painted here, endometriosis can strangulate the ureter. Uh, and this is an emergency where um, either an urgent operation or uh, something called a stent which is a little, um, uh, basically a small cannula is, or a small splint is put inside the ureter to make sure that the ureter doesn't get blocked. Because if the ureter gets blocked, it's like one is standing on a garden hose, the urine backs up and backs up into the kidney and harms the kidney. Um, what we also have here is these ligaments, at the, that is the vagina, and at the very top of the vagina we have two ligaments called uterosacral ligaments, and they are the favorite spot for endometriosis, it just loves it there. When I do surgery I always check the whole length of the uterosacral ligaments, um, because uh, they are likely to have, you know, if there's endometriosis, endometriosis always uh, likes that spot. Uh, and then endometriosis, once it's gone into the uterosacral ligaments, it can go quite deep and it can also uh, start pulling the ovaries towards the uterus. It's usually uh, then stuck to the uterosacral ligaments. So we have the ovaries sitting here. They can be affected with ovarian cysts. And then we've got the tubes here with fingers and the fingers pick up the eggs from the ovary. So what I want to show here is that the uterus, if there's no adenomyosis, the uterus is an innocent bystander. And all the endometriosis is not in the uterus. It's around the uterus. Um, and that black stuff can make a hysterectomy very difficult. And if there's no time or no special expertise, uh, a doctor might make a judgment during surgery to leave the endometriosis behind and just cut off the top of the uterus, uh, which what we call a subtotal hysterectomy. Now, the downside is that the endometriosis is still there. Yeah, so, but even if the whole uterus is removed, what we call a total hysterectomy, uh, and the endometriosis is left behind, then it is still possible that pain is left behind. And that is why I call the uterus the innocent bystander, because the endometriosis is, is usually outside and away from the uterus, and the uterus is not contributing much to the pain unless there is marked adenomyosis. And in, in those circumstances, there might be benefit from doing a hysterectomy. But unfortunately, uh, the data shows that if you do a hysterectomy with the main indication for pain relief, only half of the women who have a hysterectomy uh, get the pain relief that they wish for. So the hysterectomy that is sometimes seen as the miracle cure or the last hope for cure is actually then uh, a disappointing thing. But then for other women where the adenomyosis is really a big deal or and where the periods are unmanageable, there 
uh, a hysterectomy um, can play a positive role. Okay, um, slowly coming to the end of my talk. Um, so pandemic, post-pandemic, the special things that have happened uh, is delay. Um, having surgery in a different hospital and perhaps having a pre-admission in a different hospital, possibly meeting a different team. Um, but another really important thing that is coming out of this is because of the delay, um, it might be a valuable thing to revisit the non-surgical treatment options um, that could involve hormones, um, acupuncture, exercise, specialized physiotherapy, uh, diet, painkillers, and Zolodex. Okay, so stay safe, and I wish you all well with, um, with your health. Thank you, Liza. Such a great talk. So much information. Thank you so much. Um, I do have some more questions for you. Um, I'll just get the first one up. Okay, so is there anything someone can do to speed up getting a pelvic scan? Speed up getting a pelvic scan? Um, yes. Yeah, there is a backlog in the NHS because there are some cancer patients waiting for pelvic scans. Um, working both in the private and the NHS setting, um, it is possible to get a more timely scan in the private setting, but that would have to be paid or covered by um, private health insurance. Um, and then I think it would be really important to make sure if, if you actually make the decision to pay for your scan, you want um, a specialized team to carry out the scan uh, rather than uh, a general sonographer because a general sonographer will probably only pick up the ovarian cysts and more subtle endometriosis or endometriosis of the uterosacral ligament uh, is not picked up by a standard sonographer that uh, can only be seen by a specialist. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, so you might have already touched on this before, um, but what's the average waiting time for surgery? Oh, that's a difficult one. I've, uh, um, when I go through my, my list here, this list, um, and I've gone through the waiting list many times during the pandemic in the, the little downtime that I had, um, some of my patients have been on this list since 2019. So that is something that is very difficult to answer um, because I have no idea how long an individual has been on a waiting list. That will be taken into account, but it also be taken into account whether there are really large ovarian cysts. That, that is something where um, there is a small chance of um, abnormalities in very large, and we're talking 12, 15 centimeter endometriosis cysts. So women who have such large cysts, um, they are currently being moved up on the waiting list. Um, but for other endometriosis, it is, is very difficult to make predictions. And I, I did a questionnaire, and some of you might have answered the questionnaire. I asked both service users and, and doctors about you know, what, what they did during the pandemic. And um, I, I got sort of countrywide feedback of very little surgery, but then there are some units that are already restarting surgery. So, you know, for, uh, for the country, it's even more difficult to give a prognosis. And if we just go back to the last slide, whilst on this frustrating waiting list, um, the things that 
um, the non-surgical treatment options might require revisiting. And I am sure it's of a little consolation for people who are in daily pain. And I appreciate that very much. Um, but, you know, as, as NHS doctors, we're, we're really uh, doing our very best, but a lot of it is actually a decision by the hospital management uh, that um, where surgery can be done and at what severity, because um, cancer and suspicious cysts are graded higher than other endometriosis. However, there is now a new category of pain. So having coexisting pain also moves people up higher on the waiting list. And, and some of my patients have been in A&E several times. And then in the summer, I had a, a, a window where I could actually do surgery. And one lady during the follow-up, she said, oh, I used to be in A&E every single month. And, you know, since the surgery, she's never been back. So that was, um, th that really changed a, a, a patient journey. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't give a, a more precise answer. No, thank you, Liza. That was a lot of information. And I'm really happy to hear about your, your patient that's not in A&E anymore. Um, so can someone have a family member stay with them in hospital? Uh, as a rule of thumb, um, the hospital is trying, or all hospitals are trying to reduce the footfall. And um, on what we call the green pathway is people who, patients who had uh, negative COVID swabs, uh, being kept away from people who are at risk of COVID, um, we're trying to minimize the footfall. So uh, in many cases, the answer is no, uh, but there might be units where the um, uh, relatives might be allowed in the near future. Um, as I and myself, I my NHS work was outsourced to three different private hospitals and they all had slightly different regulations. Um, but I'm also aware that uh, I, I the other day I was helping uh, one patient to carry all her belongings to the front, uh, to the lobby because uh, her husband was picking her up there and he wasn't allowed to come in and uh, you know after surgery you don't feel like carrying a lot so yeah so unfortunately uh, in many cases relatives will not be allowed but then there's FaceTime. Yes okay. there is. <laughs> um, so what do you do when a patient has lots of scarring? Is that cause for concern? And uh, it depends a little bit on the type of scarring. Um, so the, the scarring that can come from previous surgery um, might be an issue. Let's say someone had a, a tummy cut from the belly button downwards for some emergency surgery. Um, when you then do keyhole surgery, it's, uh, you have to modify the technique and take extra time so that you don't inadvertently run into scarring and uh, because of the scarring inadvertently harm the bowel. And with open, open procedures as a rule of thumb cause more scarring than laparoscopic procedures. Um, so people who had previous surgery have surgical scarring, also for cesarean sections, uh, and there are a few um, surgical tricks to make this safer and avoid uh, traumatizing, uh, traumatizing the body. Um, then there's scarring caused by disease, and that could be uh, typically by either chlamydia, which is a sexually transmitted infection that can cause scarring, uh, and then there's scarring caused by endometriosis. A scarring can be filmy, that looks a little bit like a cobweb, um, and that can usually be removed and it doesn't come back. But thicker scars have the tendency to come back, and then sometimes within the scar tissue is active endometriosis disease. 
Uh, and that is the type of scar tissue that I try not to leave behind because uh, otherwise I would have done an incomplete removal of endometriosis. And I'll just go back to the sketch of the uterus, the special scarring that comes with endometriosis is that black stuff here along the uterosacral ligaments. So that, that some people call that burnt out endometriosis, but every time I cut it out and send it to the lab, um, they say there's active endometriosis cells in there. So this is called the endometriosis plaque. And that is a good question to ask your surgical team, whether they're only planning to take away the ovarian cysts or what they would do if they find a plaque of endometriosis or endometriosis deeply infiltrating the uterosacral ligaments, because uh, in order to fully remove endometriosis and get these good pain curves that are showed in the, uh, the audit data, there, I, I believe you have to uh, completely remove endometriosis and not just um, the ovarian cysts. Okay, thank you, Liza. Um, my next question is, um, I have, if you have a pre-assessment and you've had the blood work and the MRSA swab um, done, but you don't have a date for surgery, is that normal? Yes. This is an attempt to have, um, have you ready for surgery when a list comes up. So um, it is, it's not ideal because ideally, I think uh, a patient wants to know I'm having pre-assessment and then I'll get my surgery date. But what sometimes happens is that a group of patients, uh, you know, some patients opt out at the very last moment and then uh, the person in the hospital called the scheduler um, would like to fall back on someone who is ready for surgery. And that is why the pre-assessment happens for a bigger group of people than uh, is actually spaced on the list. So that when, let's say, a patient doesn't pass the pre-assessment, the surgical space becomes available. And the next ready patient who has passed the pre-assessment can then get that space. Um, so when you actually want to know where you are on the waiting list, uh, a good person to ask for when you phone switchboard is the gynecology scheduler, because that is the person who deals with that pre-assessment to surgery date transition. Okay, so the next question is, which is the most appropriate technique wide excision or diathermy or both depending on severity yes um, i'm glad i've got the current slide up this deep endometriosis that is affecting the uterosacral ligament if you diathermize that the the heating doesn't destroy the full depth liza you've got the thank you and good luck slide which slide um should be up um, the one with the uterus, let me... Oh, uh, yeah, we can see it in a small, on the side. Um, okay, let me just get that right again. Um, mm -hmm. Go away. And here, share screen. Uh, okay, so that's a good luck slide. Uh, end of slideshow. Okay, give me two ticks. Is that visible now, the uterus? No, no, but um, I could still see it on the smaller side. So if it, if you can, if that's the only way to show it, then that's fine. Yeah. But um, but all we can see is the end of slideshow um, with and it's black right now. Hmm. Strange. Do you, do you see something different from what I can see? Let's try once more. Uh, okay. Is that still? Yep. So the so uterus and slide. The innocent bystander slide we can see. Innocent bystander. Okay. Perfect. So that that black stuff 
that is deep endometriosis. That that wouldn't work if that gets diathermied. Um, the the heat wouldn't get deep enough to destroy that. So I believe for for deep that deep endometriosis of the uterus sacral ligaments, I, I think that needs to be cut out or excised. Also, if endometriosis is affecting the ureter, if you, if you as a surgeon, imagine you are the surgeon, if you use heat to treat the endometriosis over the ureter, the heat could damage the ureter. So these are two examples where um, you really carefully have to peel it off the endometriosis. Painstaking operation takes uh, sometimes one and a half hours just to deal with this area here. Yeah? And diathermy wouldn't work. Also, if endometriosis affects the bowel, you can't use diathermy because you might actually burn a hole in the bowel. Uh, so there uh, you need to use a cutting and possibly a bowel repairing technique. If there is a more of a surface endometriosis, which is a bit like, imagine the shape of a, a ladybird, where it is just like a, a little uh, convex, concave uh, nest of endometriosis, there it doesn't seem to make such a big difference whether you burn it away or melt it away or you cut it out. But when the endometriosis goes deeper, uh, the, the burning is, is not a good technique. Um, personally, I, I think the excisional technique also leaves a better healing because if someone has burnt endometriosis and then another surgeon goes in to do another keyhole surgery a few years later, it's very difficult to see if the, the, um, what remains from the first surgery, the burnt area, is active endometriosis, burnt endometriosis or scars. That, that is then quite difficult to tell apart. In any case, then I would excise it anyway and send it to the lab. And then they say, usually there's still endometriosis cells in there. Uh, so uh, what I, I think would be good to discuss with your team, what, what surgical techniques they can offer. If, if your surgeon says, um, they never excise, excision is not what they offer, um, then I think it is would be good to request an operative workup that indicates that you don't have the deep disease affecting the bowel. If the hospital doesn't do that, there are some hospitals who do a two-step procedure um, where the, the first person it does more of an assessment and treats the endometriosis they are confident to treat and then book for a second surgery to deal with the deeper uh, endometriosis. My personal belief is that it's better to do a one-stop shop and I very rarely do two-stage surgeries, mainly in more severe bowel endometriosis, that two-stage surgery is, is done uh, at the Royal London Hospital. But the, these are things that I think would be good to bring up in that conversation, the decision-making conversation for, for surgery. Because if, if only the ovarian cysts are removed, but the other endometriosis can't be removed, you might want to ask for a, a second opinion um, or you know, go to see an opinion from um, endometriosis centre surgeon. Thank you, Liza. Um, I have another question for you. So um, is there, does surgery, will surgery impact fertility in any way? Um, potentially, yes. Um, mainly if there is repeated surgery on the ovaries, these white things here at the side. If they are full of cysts and the, the cysts are taken away, during the taking away of the cysts and the mending of the ovary and the stopping of bleeding, there is always some of these millions of eggs that sit in the uh, cover of the ovary get hurt during ovarian surgery. So if there's repeated um, ovarian cyst removal, um, that, can, that can actually reduce the, the number of eggs uh, in the ovary. Uh, and that is the reason why 
um, it should be well planned. Um, if, if someone has uh, ovarian cysts coming back and they are just small, it might be better not to do surgery rather than jump in and do many surgeries on, on the ovary. Okay, so um, would you still recommend a laparoscopy if symptoms improve whilst waiting for surgery? No, I think it would be probably a good idea to ask for another scan uh, to see if, um, you know, ovarian cysts, uh, they can go away. And there is also, there is research data, not that much, um, but there is a little bit of research data showing that sometimes endometriosis can get better by itself. So I, I wouldn't necessarily push for surgery if the symptoms get better because the surgery in itself has some risks. Remember the yellow form when with the bleeding infection and trauma. And if the, the um, you know, the, the benefit, which is pain improvement, is, is not to be had, then I wouldn't necessarily go ahead with surgery. But then there are people who really want to know whether they have endometriosis or not, and they want to have a, a laparoscopy, and the laparoscopy is still the gold standard for making the diagnosis. It's also good for treatment, but for making the diagnosis, the laparoscopy is still the gold standard. So I personally would say if I get better, I wouldn't want surgery, but I can also understand people who say, I really want to know whether I have endometriosis or not. Thank you, Liza. Um, the next question is, if I don't have anyone to go with me to surgery, can they still have it? Yes. Um, the question is, um, the first night after a general anesthesia, it's a good idea to have someone um, at home. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a husband or um, boyfriend. It can be um, any family member or any friend um, who, who just keeps an eye on things in case there is uh, vomiting or fainting. These are the things that could happen. Sometimes also difficulty to pass urine and very occasionally there's a trip back to the hospital and then it's really good to have someone for transport. If you don't have anyone who can do this and in the pandemic, I can also understand that there are rules and regulations not to have um, people outside your bubble staying over. There's also the possibility of discussing that at the pre-admission visit and then booking an extra night in the hospital. Because the next day, um, th that concern that I just mentioned is, uh, is not there any longer. Uh, and you could take a, a taxi home and, and be okay at home without anyone physically being there. But I, I think it is a good idea to have uh, you know, people phoning in on you, checking in on you, make sure in, in any case. Uh, I think it is good to tell the hospital early enough that you need an extra bed for the night, um, rather than just mentioning it on the day, because <laughs> on the day it's sometimes a bit difficult to uh, just um, pull a bed out of thin air. <laughs> Thanks, Liza. Um, my next question is, so I think it's referring to um, when you talk about the recovery times and what you can do afterwards. So um, how does that relate to more severe, um, for example, stage four endo cases, especially bowel and bladder? Um, there are, uh, I, I see people who had quite severe endometriosis um, after four weeks actually doing quite well. Um, so um, there is the, a similar um, recovery pathway from what I've said before. I think what needs to be taken into account, a, I think a hysterectomy or if a fibroid was removed at the same time, there the healing takes a bit longer. That is more towards the six week mark. Uh, what could also make the recovery longer is if there was a lot of pain and stress before. So I, I think I touched on uh, how important it is in that prehabilitation to work on the um, 
you know, have good pain relief, be in a good state of uh, both emotional and physical health, because that can help with the recovery. Uh, so, for instance, people who have migraines or fibromyalgia, uh, there it can sometimes take longer, even longer than six weeks to get better, because the, the body's resilience can be lower and it just takes longer time. All right, thank you. The next one is, would you consider removing an ovary if it has multiple recurring cysts? Oh, and endometrios, no. endometriomas. I, I'm, I'm very committed to not removing anything that that you might need for making your own hormones or having a baby. Um, I, I would tend to remove cysts, um, but that is my that is my philosophy. I my training was in a fertility center and what the the uh, idea was called radical but fertility sparing endometriosis surgery radical means uh, i'm radical with the endometriosis cells whether they are an ovarian cyst um, because the the cyst can be uh, basically the endometriosis that created the cyst can be shelled out of the ovary um, and basically excised. Um, I, I would talk to that person about the um, things that can prevent endometriosis from coming back, uh, for instance, these hormonal methods. Uh, but I, I don't think I've ever removed an ovary. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and I have another cyst question. So all, are all complex cysts for pathology assessment to check for cancer? Well, a complex cyst, um, that's an interesting word. Um, we, we have basically two categories. One is called a simple cyst, which is a cyst that just has one chamber, which is like a, a party balloon filled with water. And a complex cyst is anything else. So a complex cyst might have two chambers, um, or it might have uh, so concerning features for it not being completely harmless. Um, and then there are basically cysts that very much look like cancer, and then there are cysts that are neither completely harmless, not completely cancer, and they're called borderline. And, and one of the things that the sonographer looks out for is little finger-like fronds that dangle into the cyst and they're called papillary projections. Um, basically what is sent to histopathology is everything that is removed from the body, whether it's a simple cyst, the wall of a simple cyst or the wall of a complex cyst it is all routinely sent into the lab. Thank you, Liza. And um, so the next question is, how can you ensure the surgeon is specialized? Um, well, you could go to, on the first slide, you might recall the, the, all the companies or the bodies I'm related to. So the BSGE, the British Society of Gyne Endoscopy, um, has a website. And on this website, they have all the, uh, the centers in the UK that are either uh, already recognized endometriosis center or they're in the process of being recognized. And they have the named surgeons uh, listed in, uh, for every center. So you could, uh, if, if you were considering, um, uh, you know, checking your, in your local hospital, that's an endometriosis center, go on the website. If you are, you know, thinking of doing, going private, then you can also check if the private doctor that uh, you've chosen is uh, related, is working for an endometriosis center. That way, you know that this doctor has to show um, videos of their operating skills to the British Society of Gynae Endoscopy and also 
has to follow up their patients and and show that they're getting better and they're not uh, you know getting many complications so there is a, a the monitoring is happening and then you can be as sure as possible that you're dealing with a, a specialist who can actually do the excisional technique that we have touched on already. Right. Um, could you give some information about preserving surgery, um, particularly the drainage of endometriosis? Um, yeah, so I, I think this is touching on the fertility sparing aspect. Draining um, uh, ovarian endometriosis cyst is a technique that I've mainly seen in the fertility unit. So what, what the fertility doctors sometimes do is um, it is easier not to work with ovaries when you do fertility treatment if they're full of cysts. So what they sometimes, the fertility doctors do is they drain the cysts, do the fertility treatment, and then they that, that's it. The drainage was just to make the fertility treatment easier. If you drain a, an uh, endometriosis cyst, the lining of the cyst is still there. And the lining of the cyst is made up of cells that uh, are similar to the cells that line the uterus. I don't know if you can see my arrow, but this is what we call the endometrium. These cells make periods every month. These cells are also in endometriosis misplaced onto the ovary where they create a cyst they line the cyst and make a period every month and, and that blood that comes from these cysts fills up the, the ovarian cyst. So if you drain it but leave these cells behind, what they do the next month is they just carry on and fill up the cyst again with blood. So they, the drainage would not be a very sustainable way of treating an ovarian cyst. The, the idea is to, to actually remove the, the lining of the cyst that is full of these cells that, that create this misplaced period. Thank you, Liza. Um, if hysterectomy surgery for adenomyosis mm -hmm. is treated, would you take the ovaries as well? Um, yeah, that, that's a bit of a, a personal preference. I tend to leave ovaries behind because if I, if I did a hysterectomy for adenomyosis, I would also tidy up all the endometriosis and wouldn't leave any endometriosis behind. So that way, the ovaries um, can still go on to produce hormones. And I just hope that there's no new endometriosis coming back. So the connection between ovaries and endometriosis is as follows. The ovaries make hormones uh, and um, during the fertile years of um, a woman's life, these hormones go up and down. And that is what endometriosis feeds from. If hormones fluctuate, uh, that is what endo likes. If hormones are given at a very high level nonstop, like with the pill injection, that doesn't feed endometriosis. And if hormones are completely gone, like after the menopause or with the removal of the ovaries, then endometriosis gets starved as well. Um, but I, I tend to weigh up the risks and benefits of going into a, an earlier menopause from ovarian removal. Um, and I... I don't really, it's not really part of my practice to remove ovaries, but I'm aware that other doctors do that. So I'm, I'm rather radical on the endometriosis, but gentle on, on the other organs. Okay, thank you, Liza. Um, do they look for ad adamant oh, every time? Um, <laughs> yeah, <it's> yeah. <laughs> as part of the laparoscopy? Uh, yeah, well, I tend to, well, if you look into the medical textbooks, the adenomyosis is, uh, is described as the uterus is boggy. Now, what is boggy? Boggy is really soft. If, if you think, for instance, uh, sometimes in pregnancy, people get a lot of water in their legs. They get sort of edema. So the, the uterus looks as if it was full of edema. 
Um, and what I do is I use a blunt instrument and, and make a little dent in the uterus. And then I can see that there is a little groove where I actually indented the uterus. And then I know we're dealing with a, a boggy uterus. Um, and, and that is adenomyosis. Yeah. So um, it, you can, during a keyhole surgery, you can, you can get a feel you can feel along the, the uh, sponginess or the, the texture of an organ. So looking for adenomyosis is, is part of my, my uh, the diagnostic part of the laparoscopy. Uh, adenomyosis can also show up on ultrasound scan and on MRI scan, but it needs a trained person to look for it. And sometimes in the ultrasound scan, the report reads heterogeneous uterus rather than they don't use the word adenomyosis, our sonographers, they use heterogeneous wall of the uterus or myometrium. So that's a good term. I always tell my medical students, look out for that word. That uh, is, is adenomyosis. Thank you, Liza. Um, and if you have endometrioma, does that mean you have endometriosis? Yeah, good question. If you have an endometrioma, um, what it means is you have a blood filled cyst on the ovary um, and, and there are really two reasons to have a blood filled cyst on the ovary um, on scan. So it could either be uh, a genuine endometriosis cyst, but it could also be a cyst that came from ovulation. Now, remembering biology, Ovulation means releasing an egg. By the process of ovulation, the uh, ovary is sometimes left with a little scar that fills up with fluid. Sometimes there's a bit of bleeding inside. And then we've got this blood filled cyst that is coming and going with the menstrual cycle. It's not endometriosis, but it can look a bit like endometriosis because it's a blood filled cyst. Uh, and, and the best way of telling the two apart is doing another scan a few months later. So, and if that cyst is, is getting bigger, it, it is more likely to be an endometriosis cyst. And if it's staying the same, getting smaller or disappearing, it was probably uh, a cyst that comes and goes with the menstrual cycle. Okay, hey, thank you, Liza. Um, I've come to the end of my questions. So if anyone does have um, a question, um, like send it through now. Um, we've got a few minutes left, um, but if not, then um, that's it. But I just want to say thank you, firstly, Eliza, just because every question I've been giving, <laughs> you've just um, answered with so much um, depth. Um, so thank you. And oh, just some, something's come through. Give me a moment, let me have a read. Okay, so um, if someone's had um, an emergen emergency laparoscopy before, um, because of a um, because of something else, um, if they um, and nothing was found, um, no endometriosis was found in the process. If they think that they have endometriosis now, um, is it still possible for them to be um, referred for surgery um, again? And is, is it worth um, doing it? It's worthwhile because during an emergency laparotomy, um, you mainly look for big things. You look for a burst appendix. Uh, you look for a gallbladder problem. Uh, you don't really go into the detail of searching for subtle endometriosis. In order to see these ligaments here that I've painted sort of black, infiltrated with endometriosis, you actually need to move a lot of organs to the side, especially you need to manipulate the uterus, the womb, in a, in a way that you can see these things. And doing an emergency laparoscopy, um, there, there's, uh, there's not really the time for, for such detail. Emergency laparoscopy might have been undertaken by a bowel surgeon 
for uh, you know looking for uh, appendicitis so the the setup for a gynecological operation is a little different because we are more interested in the area around the cervix and the bowel surgeons more focused on the appendix um yeah i mean it also depends a little bit on how long ago um the the emergency surgery was because if if there's sort of one two years gap there's also a possibility that something new has arisen um so the the hallmarks of endometriosis is painful periods uh and and painful sex and ovulation pain uh but then there's also less specific things like um, fatigue and and the bowel problems even if it's not genuine bowel endometriosis Okay, thank you. Um, so if someone has decided to go private, do they need to ask um, for their notes and scans from another from the hospital before? Yeah, so the first thing is when you go private, uh, I think it's a good idea to make sure that the doctor you're entrusting with your health has the, the right expertise, as, as we said, is part of an endometriosis center. And then um, if you are self if you're self-paying, uh, you might then get charged for all the uh, imaging. So if you have NHS imaging, uh, it would be very valuable for that to be communicated to the private doctor, uh, which means that uh, you might avoid repeating some of the imaging, especially MRI scans. Uh, what we sometimes do at, at my NHS uh, hospital, if we have people coming from uh, another hospital, um, the MRI scans can sometimes be transferred onto the hospital system and then our MRI um, team member, the uh, MRI specialist who is part of the multidisciplinary team, she can then have a, another look at the images. So it might be transfer of images, it might be you want to bring them on the disc, uh, or you just bring the report and then depending on this preoperative workup the private doctor wants to do, they, they would then really benefit. What would also be beneficial if you had reports of any previous laparoscopic surgeries, because as we said before, this is really the gold standard of diagnosis. And um, you know, if there was endometriosis seen before, the, the new doctor would like to, probably would like to know where exactly was it, how was it treated, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so next question is, can I ask my consultant about what type of a surgery I'm having before, um, before the day um, of surgery? And are they able to contact them beforehand to ask any questions? Yes, I think, not uh, shortly before surgery, but a longer time before surgery, I think it would be good to have a surgical plan, at least a roadmap um, that is a rough plan of what might happen during surgery. Some of the detail can only be decided during surgery, but a, a rough plan like, are we going to just have a look and uh, just remove them? part of the endometriosis and then do a second surgery or are we going to do everything in one go these these questions i think should be discussed well before surgery because if then the surgeon if, if the surgeon says oh you know i'm i'm only qualified to treat uh, endometriosis that doesn't involve the ureter that doesn't involve the bowel and if I find that, I'll just uh, abandon the surgery. Then, um, you know, you, you have to make sure that you are comfortable with that plan. And if not, you might then uh, want to, to get a second opinion. Or if the surgeon is very comfortable that you're likely to have not the most advanced stage of endometriosis and that's well in their remit of treating, then that's also a good, uh, important conversation to be had. Um, contacting the team is very difficult. All our, our secretaries are shielding. We're having really big hurdles with the admin, but thankfully we have an endometriosis specialist nurse who uh, gives out their, her contact details. So your hospital might have an endometriosis specialist nurse 
you can contact. Um, and otherwise, I probably would try to contact the um, uh, the secretary, the named secretary for the consultant. Um, and if, if that is not possible, uh, I think you could uh, ask for the gynecology service manager because that is from the managerial point of view, that is the person who has the overview, who is working from home during the pandemic, who is off sick during the pandemic, who is the contact person. So service manager is, is a good person to ask for if you can't get hold of a secretary or a specialist nurse. Thank you, Liza. And I'm going to make this my last question, um, just because we're just out of time right now. Um, but does menopause generally make endometriosis symptoms disappear? It generally, as a general rule of thumb, it makes the pain better. Um, the endometriosis feeds from the fluctuation of hormones, so the up, up and down of hormones. And in the menopause, the hormones, so after the menopause, the hormones are low. So endometriosis is, is likely to dry up and go away. However, I'm glad I've still got this slide up. Can everyone see that slide? That here, that black Yes, slide, we can. Deep endometriosis can leave scarring even after the menopause. And then there is a possibility that when the, um, the vagina is less stretchy, and the uterus is a bit stuck because of the endometriosis that there might be painful sex despite the endometriosis being starved because of the menopause. Uh, and then it might be a good idea to use some lubricants when you have sex or use a, a sexual device called the ONAP device um, that can help with uh, pain that comes from scarring. Thank you so much, Liza. I can't tell you how much we appreciate you just um, sharing all this information with us. And um, the slides were fantastic. And then also how much information you gave um, and attention you get, gave to the questions has just been brilliant. Thank you so much. And um, thank you to everyone who, who's, who's watched this as well. And it will be available on our website too. Yeah, great questions. Really good questions. I'm very impressed. Oh, thank you so much.